So, uh, Brian, no, tell me, I do want to hear about your background um, before we get started, though. <laughs> I, can I can I kind of say something here? I met Brian the other day on a, a blab about eleven o'clock. That it started out about eleven, and then well, no, actually that was when it started out about eight, I think. And then uh, he came on about eleven o'clock, and then that continued on till about one or so in the morning. And I knew that he was in an interesting place because I could see. I think I saw a shooting star or something coming from behind him. There was a I don't know if you know that or not, but I saw like a. A star come from behind you and know, i like i was like i'm pretty sure he's are you seeing him. things again stan no i was pretty sure he wasn't in the <laughs> living room i knew that <laughs> it might be his living room but it wasn't the kind of living room that we're used to and so um and i immediately found figured out hey i need to introduce and talk to you guys because he i'm gonna let him brian tell you a little bit about what he's doing down there too and uh because i think you guys are gonna hit it off yeah pretty well Sure. Um, I'm a little more uh, fixed location than you are, although I certainly appreciate the people who are traveling around and they can compare and learn that way. For me, um, for years I had been learning and I had an opportunity to, to move here to a forest and implement a lot of food forest farming and permaculture principles. Yeah. Uh, things are a lot freer here in a lot of ways. I'm just out of the way, so I don't have a lot of licensing restrictions you might have in the States, for example. Um, and so right now we're off the grid. We're on solar power. I only have 340 watts total of, of panels, which is about what people have on their RV. So yeah. it's extremely small system. And that's that's intentional uh, because a, a large part of the goal is to develop a human culture that can use far less resources. And so every part of that system, everything we eat, uh, the way we build buildings, every detail of, of life, we want to consider in terms of energy consumption and and also it's real health in terms of, or it's real value in terms of health and sustainability. Because yeah. uh, there's a lot of projects you'll see that are kind of greenwashing, you yeah. know, where people toss lots of money at, at supposedly being green, but they're just uh, being part of the industrial world in a different way. Right. <clears throat> it's still feeding the corporate greed machine. Yeah. In so here I've managed to do that. I started in 2004. I've managed to pretty much divide from that. And I've gone through several phases of being a hermit versus having guests. Um, and right now I'm coming out of the phase of being a hermit and I'm inviting people uh, <laughs> to come here and, and bring life to the place, you know, because being a hermit was never the goal, although it was useful to break away. Now that the challenge is to bring people in and have them uh, uh, introduce some of their own values and also fit in with the culture here. Yeah. So you have to figure out how to be sustainable in your own life with your own personal um, everything that, that, that surrounds you and that you affect before you can teach other people how to do it in a sense. Yeah, otherwise your project is just lost in the, in the, you know, dominant culture. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm very interested in understanding what it takes to start a, um, I don't know, some kind of, uh, uh, organized, um, community. What's it called? An intentional community. I think there's a website called that intentional community. Yeah. Yeah, IC.org is yeah. a directory of a lot of those, and I'm on there as well. Okay. Um, but it seems like, and as I've been looking for places to stay from time to time, it seems like um, there's a very uh, a large variation between what people call con intentional communities on there. It might be somebody's just home site that they let people you know, put up tents every now and then versus a very functioning, um, organized, almost a community with almost its own government and everything. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm 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 interested in hearing what it takes to really make that happen um, successfully because you hear so many that might fail as well. You know? Yeah. Well, if you look through IC.org, it's really uh, educational. You do see a lot of forming projects. You see a lot of you know four people, and it's a community, or guys like me who are hermit, and it's called a community. Um, and and as you, as you scan them, it's it's really interesting to to look at what you would want or not want by far the most successful long-term ones are spiritually based, um, which is not my personal objective. In fact, I don't want a narrow spiritual view. Um, that would not provide the diversity I want, but it's very interesting to note those are the successful ones. They're hierarchical with an invisible being in charge represented by authoritarians. Um, then there's the forming ones of the actual successful functioning intentional communities. There's almost none. There's Twin Oaks, Dancing Rabbit, um, in terms of the total massive number of people interested, 
basically no one's actually living in them. And it's a great question to ask, well, how come we're not doing it? What are the real problems here in forming and running these? I have an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the first step of forming an intentional community is forming your own intention, right? So that's what I'm in the process of doing now is shedding valuables, changing the way I eat, visiting places like here to learn about permaculture and learn about um, sustaining myself in a way that doesn't kill my environment and also reduces my resource use, right? Because a lot of this green stuff is somebody who's already living like a middle-class American life and wants to do it greener, but they're still sucking up the same amount of resources to do to continue living the way they're living. And I really don't think that you can do that, <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think part of the reason why there's not a lot of intentional communities that are surviving without that spiritual layout is because you need a layout. But if people don't take the time to figure out what their intention actually is, I think sometimes the cart goes before the horse and they try to put the community together to figure out the intention. And then there's too many cooks in the kitchen, you know? Yeah. So that kind of deal, like walking the walk first and then inviting other people to walk it with you. Yeah. Wayne, Wayne, meet Courtney. Courtney, meet Wayne. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Courtney. Sorry. I forgot it's, to introduce you. It's a good point that you make. Um, so is it possible to define a community around a spiritual topic? Or is it is it possible to define spirituality? in a community without defining religion? So we yeah. do that. Uh, there's a place called Damahur or somewhere in Italy. And uh, it's it's kind of has a new age vague spirituality with lots of happy words. And so that's possibly um, more, it allows for greater uh, diversity of personal lifestyle, personal views, personal uh, cultural expression than a strict one, like uh, for example, the Amish or Mennonites might. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And then you've got these communities, as I've been traveling across the country, um, there's a pretty good size one or several communities within the Ozarks um, in Missouri, in, in the north part of the Ozarks, where they're, you know, they're not tightly regulated, similar to what you're suggesting, where it's, it's a lot more free to do what you need to do to survive. And um, uh, these, these people are coming together and putting together these groups of 30-plus uh, uh, families who all have different skill sets and they are a community without being a functional intentional community if that makes any sense right um, and, and i'm starting to see that more and more and more in these small towns these communities that are dying seem to be coming together over this one topic and that is the need that, that we're not always going to have government to, to be there to yeah. give us a handout or support us so to speak well and and, and you, you look at why the small communities are dying a lot of it's because of cheap energy that's allowed us to live in cities uh, with a very high standard of living, a uh, high standard of living. Yeah. Um, and so it's very likely as energy costs go up that you'll find that the, the smaller communities are once again more viable and attractive. So the, the ones you mentioned, so those are families coming together. They're not necessarily defining their community, but functionally they're helping each other because they have real need. Is that what they're doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess um, they, they are there to help each other in case something changes economically to the point where they are going to need each other to support the themselves and or the fact that they do still buy and buy and sell and exchange goods and services among themselves because they kind of have to they're just this 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 community of people who've already said look we will get along um oh and we all have these unique skill sets and talent base to 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 get along with so um why not barter with those skill sets yeah. and talents yeah. versus using a monitoring system. It sounds like there's an intention there then, like either to be living that way or preparing to have to live that way. Yeah. And to be good yeah. neighbors. Now, what I like about that, that kind of vision is it's fairly flexible. If people are owning their own stuff and trading with each other, then they're not stuck into a system. One of the things that, that I think you, you might be interested in noting as you evaluate different types of communities is what levels of community ownership they have. And I find a large number of people who are interested in community, who are very interested in communal ownership, but in my studies and my experiences, I believe that, it, that communal ownership or owning things together inevitably leads to conflict. You yeah. will find the resources, even a couple. I mean, you look at how, how marriages end. I mean, my God, you can't even have two people make a community where they share things like children. 
Yeah. So I'm very interested in, in, in retaining people's private autonomy, not having to bow down to a central authority, and then coming together voluntarily, building real wealth for each other. Then you, you know, you get into tool sharing and, and you know, helping each other get a job or improve skills because that helps your group. You know, I've always thought it would be interesting to, when, when I lived in the Carolinas, I lived in North and South Carolina for a while, and there's all of these um, uh, chicken barns that are no longer usable, or turkey barns and chicken barns. And they're, they're a perfect barn to make be a community barn, so to speak. Not like one end could be a mess hall, another end could be, I don't know, a produce processing facility, and then everything in between could be divided up into like mini stalls for people to store all their goods and, 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 and their equipment and tools um, and access without, it could be locked, it could be their own storage facility, but it would be centrally located to where if they did want to share, there could be a, a, even that could be, it's, it's the center of sharing, so to speak. And then you could each have individual home sites that kind of circle that central location. I have a question for you. As yeah. you visit these different places, um, you have this opportunity to really get a, an interesting vision of, of the diversity there. Do you kind of have a spreadsheet or a list that you sort of fill out about places to kind of figure out which attributes might correlate with which other um, benefits or troubles? No, I haven't been. Um, I've just been pushing my time and my energy so much that it's <laughs> been all I can do to get across the country by bike <laughs> and then film what I'm seeing and, and yeah. viewing. And then potentially, if I have time, I'll get it produced <laughs> um, yeah. and uploaded to YouTube. And then the description needs to be wrote in the blog posts, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a few steps that goes into just that. I wish I had more time for it. Well, yeah. the great thing is you're documenting with a camera, and that thinking can happen later. Um, yes. one, one idea I have for you is to look at IC.org and look at what attributes they have, and then use that almost as a list of things to notice, you know? Like, where is their water coming from? How much food are they raising? Where is their electricity coming from? What's the social structure they say they have versus the one they really have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, 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 that's it. really where my question came from earlier. Yeah. He wasn't, he, he didn't even ride bikes, by the way, until he started doing this. He had to go learn how to ride a bike. You know, he so, he sounds new to me. Yeah. yeah. But it is the way to travel. You have picked the best way to travel because you go fast, you're healthy. And you're really there. You bleed on that ground, you know, as opposed to being in a car where it's just a 360 degree movie. Yeah, you, you do get grounded and very um, <laughs> centrally located, centrally located spiritually, I guess, <laughs> with right. with what you're going through at that time, very much in the present. And it's made me start to think about business decisions. I was talking with Laney, who's chatting here on the side but earlier today and, and um it really has helped me to think outside the box when it comes to making business choices and to start to, to use my gut, which I guess could be a spiritual leading um, to, to make those business decisions and, um, and, or even on this track as I've been going through the country, uh, I intentionally did not plan on having lodging food and lodging every night. Uh, I, I left it open for there to be, for there to be some kind of, local community collaboration as I came through these areas and for things to just fall into place. And it's been really amazing because every day I'm taking care of, not that I'm leaving with nothing. I still have food if I need it. I have a, a way to put up a hammock if I need it. But when the goodwill of others and the hearts of others start to show, um, all of a sudden now there's a community that's quote intentional community now built around this whole trek. And like-minded people can come together and, and collaborate over it. So, um, and and then the, another unique thing about it is not only am I collaborating in real time as I'm going through, but I'm connecting with those people using social media, most generally Facebook in the small towns, and then we're using that connection to maintain a, to, to continue that personal communication and connection that, that happened in real time, and then there's conversations that happen as a result of those Facebook connections. And then at the end of the Facebook connection, all of that collaboration that happened goes back into the production before it's produced. So the further this, this, uh, uh, trek, the longer it goes, the more collaboration will roll into that final production, those 20 minute episodes. You know, I think one thing that's benefiting you too is people love bikers cyclists because you're not a bum right you might be a bum if you're just on foot even though being on foot's really cool 
you're, you're not in a car, so you look vulnerable. And people think, oh, I want to help this guy. Yeah. He's out there exposed to the elements, all these scary cars. And that's what I found cycling. Um, I used to cycle when I was younger. And people really do want to help cyclists. So that, that's in your favor. Yeah, definitely. But it's, it's uh, yeah. And I think because of that and because of being vulnerable and being very much in the moment and present in the moment, um, it has allowed for there to be some really unique collaboration that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And it'll all come out. Not only does it come out on social media, but it come, it'll come out in the production. Um, I was telling Laney earlier today, this is an interesting story. Stan, you may have heard this already, but I was headed into Poplar Bluff, Missouri, um, on the edge of the Ozarks, coming into the southeast side of them. And I was trying to find a place to stay. And I called, I was sitting at a gas station. I called, made a phone call, talked to the um, the guy that was running the only campground in town. And he says, no, we can't accept tents. We don't have, uh, we're not set up with the state to accept any kind of tents or hammocks. And I said, really? I mean, that was just, to me, it was a shock that they, they wouldn't. And I said, you can't make an exception. No, you know, it was just a dead end talking to this guy. And uh, he said, but we have something, you know, there's another campground 15 miles up the road and that's just too far for me. And as I'm talking to the guy on the phone, some guy walks in, he got gas and he walks in and he's looking at my bike and, you know, I could tell he was interested and I get off the phone, he walks out and he says, where are you going? Where are you, you know, where you been? All that good stuff. We did our quick 30 seconds. Hey, Hey. And, and he says, well, why don't you come and stay with me tonight? And as a result of being turned down at a modern facility, you know, where, where <laughs> you would think you could get lodging, I was able to meet um, a pretty cool guy and his wife and his family who are also into cycling, who gave me more advice than I could have ever have asked for, who fed me that evening, not because I'm asking for being fed, not because I'm looking for a handout, but because this community actually cares about the collaboration that's happening to this big picture. And um, so we had a really neat session and time together rather that that evening and the next morning um and then because of as a result of that i ended up meeting i went into steak and shake my tab was uh was taken care of by the table next next to me and as i was talking to them and i didn't know this at the time but as i was talking to them other people behind me and the table next over beside them and across the room they all wanted my information. They wanted to know what I was doing, where I was going and find me on Facebook. And, you know, those people now, the people that I met in that steak and shake, even though I didn't have enough money to go in and buy food, I decided to do it because I was listening to my gut. I went in there and those people who I met are now probably my biggest fans. And they share, comment on every picture, comment on every post. They share as much as they can. And no, there hasn't been financial help from them because they're all fragmented and they're all different, but that's okay. What we're doing is we're making this, we're putting together the pieces of our fragmented society and we're giving people, I think giving them an outlet to something to communicate around the topic. Um, and we're dribbling in the, oh, by the way, you should start to think like this because it only makes sense for our society to, to, to think sustainably. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a, I just kind of went off on a tangent. But those are the things that happen when, when, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was a good thing. <laughs> those are the things that, that happen when, when we really do listen to our God or we connect spiritually um, with the universe and be, being one with who, with our creator. And um, uh, when we're very open with, without planning, without using some of our logical mind, sometimes we need to step back and, and use our, our spiritual Part, cool. I guess, you know. so, uh, did, I, did I notice that you had crashed at some point? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah. So you've had your first crash. Yeah. Uh, How'd you come out of that? I, I started July 1st. I was going to leave July 1st, and uh, or no, June. I'm sorry, June 1st, and do the whole trek at, starting at that point, and I had a wreck on June 2nd. And <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the road. I made it 50 miles. <laughs> uh and, and so I had trained for a few weeks before then, um, but I hadn't loaded my bike that way ever before. I loaded it a little heavier for my second day, thinking that's kind of what I was going to run with. And um, I had it loaded wrong with too much weight on the bike trailer, and I crashed. And so I took three weeks and recovered and and uh, trained for another three weeks and went back at it again. <laughs> yeah, when you said that, made that statement a while ago about blood on the ground or something like that, I, I was like, 
uh, yeah, that kind of already happened. He, I think it yeah. was 30 miles an hour or something like that down that hill. Is that right? Yeah, a little over 30, I'm sure. And it was right on a big, you know, state road with fresh, good paved asphalt. So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I broke my elbow uh, in a 30 mile an hour downhill bicycle crash a few years ago. You're lucky you didn't really break anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very, very fortunate. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was there was a guy there uh, behind me. That uh, was kind of top in the hill when I looked back as, as I was trying to decide, do I go down the hill or let him pass me before I go down? And he's seen it all happen and said that I was out for about 10 minutes. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, and, that's serious. Yeah. So, so, so uh, do you have the map of your route up or do you know what it is? Yeah, um, I, I do as much as I can. I need to go and update the website before I leave Colorado Springs, before I move out. Um, but I do have a map up. It's on the website at worldforchange.com forward slash a trek for change. And if somebody wants to put that link in, that would be great. Also, yeah, Kathy, yeah. Kathy said uh, she'd love to ride a bike to work if she could, but um, she'd have to be able to get the kids to school and you know, if they were sick, et cetera. And obviously there's sporting events and things in our, our culture, our modern society. I think that brings up a good point that, um, as I've been doing this trek, I've realized the importance of human assisted transportation. So as if, if we use the technology we have to build good quality batteries and good electric motors, there's no reason why we can't use solar and wind and hydro to power our transportation or assist us in transporting things. And then if, we're, if we look at, um, as I've been moving through different towns and talking to people who live on bicycles, um, you find out that they really change their lifestyle dramatically and they start to look at things that are closer closer and more locally central, centralized like for their produce um, for their toiletries and you name it and if if people started to think about how they were getting around and what they were using and what the, the impact that they were making when they did move around uh, using fossil fuels and etc they might start to live a little differently and it's like what you're doing right now. You, you went into the hermit stage because you kind of had to force yourself into that to break away. I'm guessing to break away from the system that has us all bound. And if, if we start, you know, we start. It's, it's, it's we, yeah, you almost have to do it because it's it's almost like the energy is a drug and we're addicted to it. And we have to go cold turkey or or, or I guess we can reduce it as well. I was here for two years without electricity and. I really like electricity now. <laughs> I just need a little tiny bit. That's all I need. But boy, do I appreciate it. Yeah. You know? And it also allows us to be doing things like this, where it sounds like uh, one of the things that I like about what you're doing is you're, you're not just visiting the hardcore people who are already kind of there with that understanding, but you're also bringing in and having contact with people who are who are excited by your biking and, and, and can then get these other ideas from you about the world and thinking about what we're doing. That's really cool fusion, you know. Yeah, because I think it's going to take each one of us to, we, we all have to make a choice. You know, we, it, it takes each one of us individually to come together or make a choice to choose to come together. And I think we all need to pick a topic that we're, uh, I, I think to motivate people who've never thought about being sustainable, it would be pick a topic that, that they are passionate about and then ask them how they are supporting that topic with multiple inputs from their life or that 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 passion and one interesting thing the woman who mentioned that you know she can't bike because she has to take her kids to school and so forth i think it's important to remember we all are working from where we come from and not to get all you know holier than thou but to, but to really you know look at the diversity of things we need to do as a culture and each person can then choose you know i'm going to change it how i eat in this case i'm going to get a half size refrigerator I'm going to start fermenting my food. So yeah, there's so many different areas. And then if you get people doing their individual things, they come together as friends and they're sharing that, you know, well, I have chickens and I learned this and yeah, that gets really exciting. It can be like a hobby. It can be very social and, and you're building your community around the task of being sustainable. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed then if, if I look back at my life at home right now in Alabama and I think, Hmm, if I was to not drive my car, if all I did was use my, my, my bike, um, I would probably want an electric motor, so I would get a little. I would be able to haul more at a longer distance with less exertion, uh, less energy use from my body, so that I had more energy to use at home in the garden, so to speak. 
I would start to look at the local farmer who's three or four miles up the road. I work out, I would, I would work to build a relationship with that local farmer because it would be a lot more beneficial for me to build that relationship than it would be for me to go to still the locally owned grocer that gets his produce from China and Guatemala and Chile and Mexico. Right? So I would really build that relationship with the local farmer. I would figure out exactly what he could produce for me. And if he couldn't produce what I needed, I'm going to produce it or I'm going to go find another local farmer that's three miles away rather than driving 10 miles to the nearest small town. So your whole mindset really does shift when, when you restrain yourself in a way like Laney has, which has been the last three years without a bicycle, without a car. So I, I don't know. I, 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 Again, back to this, this, it's a convenience versus conviction conversation. And then how do you get people convicted that they need to make some kind of a change in their conveniences? Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty pessimistic that people will actually make change without there being a survival aspect involved. Um, there are people who are kind of conscious, there are people who are trying to see the future, but I think the majority of people um, won't change until they're forced. Well, and I think that something that's important to remember about stuff like this is that progress isn't linear, right? So I got rid of my car in 2007, living in Seattle, I could use public transportation. And then, you know, in 2012, I got a car again, because I'm, I'm an artist and a musician, and I have equipment to move around. And, and in order to uh, contribute to the world in that way, I needed to have a car. And now I only have a car. I live in a van, right? So I got rid of the house aspect, but now I live in a van, right. which isn't the same as living on a bike, but it's still way different than in 2004 when I worked at Microsoft and I had a walk-in closet the size of my living space. Right. Right. And then I really like what Brian said about um, coming from where you actually are, right? So you've got someone who's got kids and needs to have a car because of that. I'm a musician and I'm still attached to expressing myself in that way and connecting with people in that way, which means I need to be able to move my keyboard around and stuff, right? Yeah. So which yeah. means I need a van, yeah? But I'm still here, right? And learning about the Bosque and learning about permaculture. And so in that way, I'm advanced right now. And in other ways, I'm not so much. And things shift and change. And so we should be open to, to that as well, I think. Yeah, no, I think you're right, because we, we need to embrace the technology that we have. And we also need to also not limit ourselves to the technology that we think is available, because there's a lot of technology that's being suppressed. So, But we need to use that technology, and we really need to think about how we can take that and amplify our efforts to being sustainable as a human race. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we throw away all the computers and start to live with horses and plows again. It, it just means that we use those computers to intelligently communicate and to network because maybe I won't need a horse and a plow. Maybe all I need is the skill that I have already in, in, inside me to, to exchange for the food that the horse and plow my neighbor is going to use to, <laughs> to make the produce. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's back to that community mindset and it really does. It's, it's going to take, it's going to take us um, a majority of us, to make that switch within our minds, and then we'll start to come together. Um, I think that th th those members of the community will start to pop their heads up in places that you just didn't quite expect it. I mean, it's already happening to me once I finally said, look, this is the only way to make to move forward as, as a society and to make progress. And all of a sudden, people start talking to me about it. Of course, I'm on a bike ride, but still. Um, <laughs> There is a question over here, and I want to tell um, Kay Daniels that when you ask a question, if you put a front slash Q space and then put your question, it'll create a little bar or a little box there that says question. But she wanted to know, would you say the West being less developed has adopted ways for people to ride their bikes opposed to the East Coast that has been developed for decades? Oh, uh, I don't know. East Coast, West Coast thing, you know. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that um, because there's a lot less roadways and thoroughfares on the West Coast or through the West. Um, I don't know about the coast, but through the West, 
Um, there's less connecting highways, so uh, people are just um, they're they're just looking for the best. I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know. Can I give an answer to that? Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Um, our community. I live in Jupiter, Florida, and uh, the area that I live in is called Abaco, and it's a new urbanism where all medical doctors, uh, restaurants, stores, everything is within a mile or two from our house. Um, we have a downtown center, but Jupiter uh, has uh, put bike lanes on all their roads. And any new development, any new developer that's in the roads have to be built before he can finish the development. They have to be put in first and all those roads have to have bike lanes. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of cyclists down here, and I used to ride every day, and I can't anymore. Um, but you were talking about being aware. This is one community where they are aware, and uh, and also that new urbanism concept with everything being close by. We don't have to drive for miles if we don't want to to get something. Or we can, well, rob, we can, we can ride our bike and get there and the bring it back. Yeah, we need to redesign the the, the cities, really. Yeah. The towns. Yeah, our infrastructure needs to be able to support it. I mean, uh, rather than having, um, for example, a Walmart that's only located in the larger cities, you need more small town community uh, exchange going on in smaller groups in little pods and pockets throughout different cities and, and regions and states, if you will. Um, and if you have that, then you don't have a need to drive 35 or 40 miles to get what you need um, because it's provided in that local town, um, that, that local community. Right? So you're, Ron, down where you live, they are emulating, I believe, they're emulating what really needs to happen more on a small town communities scale all across America. And it, it should be happening in, in pockets of, of townships within major cities. So um, for, I'm gonna, for those that are that are uh, joining now, see some new people coming in and we're talking with Wayne Metter, who is riding a bicycle across uh, the United States um, to uh, promote sustainable living. And we're talking to Brian Fay, who and uh, Courtney, what's your last name, Courtney? I'm Courtney Fallon Rex, and I'm actually traveling the U.S. in a van with a motorcycle on the back. But I came down here for a few months to learn from Brian and to help put some systems together here. And my Brian is there in a village in um, Mexico, and I'm just going to tell th those that were in that earlier hangout with me today that when I when I referred to a guy that I met that said he was a hermit. That was Brian, and that's what he called himself. So, uh, <laughs> so I was okay with it. Um, you got to accept it. I just posted a link to my place. It's the Facebook page. If you click like on that, then uh, we're going to start broadcasting more videos and photos as I have people come in, so you can spy on our weird life here. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I thought you two guys should get together though, just because I think from a mindset of what Wayne's, you know, attempting to do and to try to show and what you're doing down there. I think that I just thought there was a good match there. And I did just so y'all know, I started reaching out and started doing some research on, you know, things that are going on. There's actually a community there for sustainable in San Diego in, or San Francisco, which is where you're going to wind up. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. there, there's a very large sustainable community there that I've reached out to today to, um, and there's a, um, I mean, it's, it, that's, that's not, probably not news to you guys, but it was to me that when I started really looking at it, that, wait a minute, there are tons of people who are interested in this stuff. And for the reasons that we weren't talking about the other night, Brian, I mean, they, they're interested in it, not because of, well, they're interested in it because of the world thing, not because of some of the reasons that we were going over the other night. So consciousness uh, is definitely spreading. And then here in Mexico, also um, the consciousness of around pollution, you know, in the in the states in the 70s, there was suddenly this realization, geez, our, our rivers are catching on fire. The fish are dying. What are we doing? And they're going through that very quickly here um, because of the Internet. It can spread much faster. Yeah. And so I'm working with with the, the towns here. Uh, 
you know, in a kind of mellow way, you know, just being a good neighbor often to, to not just teach them about other energy alternatives, but also to learn from them about using less resources. Because we often think about the first world industrial nations going to these supposedly undeveloped countries and that they're going to help them be like the first world countries. When what we really need to be doing often is learning from the people who aren't already destroying the entire planet. They're the ones who, we, who can help us. And we need to learn from them. How are they using less water because they have to? How are they feeding themselves a healthy diet that's probably healthier than a processed one? Yeah. Yeah, that uh, brings up another topic. And I made a video about it um, about a week and a half or two ago. Uh, I was coming through Kansas and Missouri and Kansas and eastern Colorado. And it's pretty much a food desert. You're going through thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of farm ground that's luscious and green and irrigated with lots of farmers and hired hands that are out there getting things done and no local birds. Right. Where do these that people go that, that in the towns of 900 people? They go to Walmart and Dollar General and that's where they get their produce. Yeah. It's sad to me. And I think there's a solution. I made a, a, a video about it asking, you know, where people go if they don't buy local produce and why. Um, don't you buy local produce? And part of that problem and, and some of the answers to that video was convenience. And the reason yeah. why it's not convenient is because, well, there's, it's not available in their local community. And, um, and so I think there's a solution for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And People work hard to let the lower cost out. Yeah. Um, one transitional thing is, is to encourage people to get into these kind of things as a hobby. For example, fermenting foods, you know, um, when, when people start it as a hobby, it will also be a, a survival skill, different types of food preservation. And so for the people who have a little extra energy or interest, uh, that's an option. Um, even building things like root cellars, you know, is a good way to go. Now, I happen to live in a place, I, I just posted a link to the um, Facebook group. I think, yeah, so you can join that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm really just blessed to live in a place where all kinds of food gr does grow locally. So the climate I'm at can grow things almost all year long. And then very nearby, there's tropical places that are growing coconuts and mangoes and papayas. Uh -huh. So that's still, depending on your definition of local, you know, within 100 miles of here, I can get a whole different um, climate of, of food types. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's huge, at least for us down in Alabama. Um, we have a pretty long growing season. But as I get up here in Colorado, we went hiking up one of the the 14,000 foot mountains up here yesterday, um, Mount Sherman. But as we were in the valley staying the night uh, camping, we were at, I'm trying to think now, a little, little over, a little over 10,000 feet maybe, somewhere in there is where we stayed at elevation wise. And I was just kind of standing there looking around, soaking it up and thinking, how would I grow my food? If I had to survive in this environment, how would I do it? And there's very little timber, a lot of rock, um, no clay really to make cob out of or any kind of a mortar. Um, there definitely is a short growing season and you get a lot of snow. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe a greenhouse or thermal insulated underground, thermal insulated type greenhouse solution. And so all of these things started to come to my mind. And um, I think we really do have to uh, step back and just evaluate every um, local region that we are and, and there's not a one-size-fits-all type of a solution for the problems we're facing um, in our food production but there's thousands of acres here in in the valleys that hardly have any food growing on them at all and what what green is growing there they're allowing cattle to graze on open range but even then it's just not very productive so how do we make that ground more productive i don't buy that that there's not enough ground on the planet to feed the population that's growing. I mean, yeah, I don't buy that that's, either. Just, that's a bunch of uh, political bull uh, that's used for manipulation, but my opinion. What state in Mexico are you living, Brian? I'm living in Michoacan, which is between uh, Mexico City and Guadalajara. The nearest place to me uh, that you can look up easy is called Pazcuaro, P-A-T-Z-Q-U- See you. So see, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I don't spell that. <laughs> Something like that. Or you can just look up Aronga, E R O N G A, and you'll find me or the area I'm in. Equally as easy. Yeah. Right. It, it's a it's a great great area, really nice people. Um people are worried about the drug war and security issues, but 
day to day, things are perfectly fine. And uh, I'm so happy I moved here. I have more community here than I ever have anywhere else in my life. Back in Seattle, I mean, I didn't know the people living on the same street as me for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't know any of them well. And here, you know, the families have been here for generations and they're really connected. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. The, the nearest town to me is about uh, three kilometers away and it's about 400 people. So, so what, what, uh, do you, do you have any tips that you would like to, uh, give Brian Wayne and what you've learned on your trip? And by the same token, Brian, is there any, I mean, I'd like to see an exchange of like of the one thing, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's like, uh, Curly, you know, in, um, what was that movie? Uh, the city slickers. What's that one thing? <laughs> so what one thing would you, you know, you think you learned it? I don't, I think I shared my one thing that I learned. And that is, the, <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, that's probably been the most impactful thing of this whole trip. Um, it's not just been a, a documentary. It's not just been a trek across America to, figure out about being sustainable or anything like that. It's, it's really just learning to listen to your gut and, and live in the moment and, yeah. and, and use all of your available energy for that, that moment. As far as my one thing I'd say, I, I don't know. It seems like you're already doing really well. Um, the camera work you're doing seems great. I was curious what kind of camera you were using, but it seems like you're getting just the right clips to tell your story. So I would just say keep doing more of that because um, that'll get you also more contacts. And I, I really enjoyed seeing uh, seeing what you've made so far. Yeah. Well, I hope that over time it doesn't get boring because it's a lot of content. There's a lot of info there, but I, I've cut out as much as I think I should <laughs> um, sure. to be able to tell the story. And it's going to be something unique. There's not a running documentary, if you will, of somebody's entire track. You know, you might have two hours on the topic for a documentary, but not – hours of content that allow people to really get in to understand what's happened in the local regions where I go through and the challenges that I've faced. Um, the camera I'm using is a, uh, I have a cam, a Canon camcorder. I don't, I think it's an RHF or RF 400. Uh, it's a low end model and it was cheap so that I could use it in YouTube videos and get it dirty and beat it up. Um, and then I have a, an iPhone six that I use for 85% of my filming. Really? Um, and then a GoPro and the GoPro was gifted to me to use for the track or let me borrow. Uh, and it's a first generation GoPro. So it's 720 P, uh, rather than 1080 or 4k, but nonetheless, it's still okay for some of the action shots and where I need to, need to get wet, so to speak. Um, uh, so that's what I'm using for the filming and I'm missing a lot of content. I really do miss a lot that I could use as B-roll to be able to tell the story a lot better um, because I'm a one man band, if you will, and trying to shoot all of this video while riding a bike, you know, and it's not necessarily an easy task. Um, I'm finding out that it takes a lot of time and where some cyclists don't have a problem making 60, 70, 80 miles in a day, I might really be challenged to make that because of the time I'm taking to shoot video as well. Yeah. Also, though, your body is just going to keep getting in better and better shape. Um, when I when I was cycling, I was amazed. My body just became like a fine-tuned machine, and doing 70 miles becomes no problem. Yeah, so I've noticed that um, at the further west I get, uh, I really am getting a lot better at making the mileage. And, you know, when I look at 60 miles, it doesn't sound like too much to me, <laughs> whereas it did before. Um, but... I'd say the most, let's see, the biggest day I've had so far, I'm packing a lot of weight, but I think it was 78 miles. Um, it might have been 89 miles. It might have been almost 90. But either way, that's a lot of miles for 120 to 130 pounds. Well, and you're hitting some big hills out there now too, yeah? Yeah, getting ready to. <laughs> yeah, this Colorado thing is going to be a big one. And I'm going to take a, a way out of Colorado, kind of the south route to get around some of the mountains. But I'm still going to go through Wolf Creek Pass, which um, is south of Salida. Um, it's a real beautiful pass. I've heard a lot of positives about it, but it's only one pass rather than two or three. Yeah. Well, the whole west is lumpy, so it's not like the east. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Utah is going to be a challenge. I have a feeling. Yeah. So, 
So what a great challenge. So how do you find how do you find the places that you want to visit? Do you look at something like IC.org or some other place? Um, I'm using that. I'm doing a lot of research ahead of time. I'm connected with quite a few people as well, and I'm allowing the moment to dictate some of that. Um, and frankly, uh, everything with exception of wanting to come to Colorado Springs and Greensburg, Kansas, which is the town that was uh, rebuilt with a bunch of LEED certified buildings, um, those, with, with, with exception of that and, and Colorado Springs, I really haven't planned. Um, oh, and Seymour, Missouri, which is where Missouri Wind and Solar is located. They're one of my sponsors. Um, they're a do-it-yourself wind and solar store. Um, and, and so those three places are the only scheduled locations that I've made it a point to go to, period. Because uh, you have a concern about it being boring. One thing you can always do is, is, is if you do go specifically visit places and know you're coming, um, you can essentially use them as interesting content. And so you're helping them share their story by asking them interesting questions and you're filling your channel up with lots of visuals and lots of other alternative points of view. Yeah, um, for example, I did that in Seymour, Missouri. Uh, there was a dulcimer factory, which oh, I think cool. is neat because I think music is important for all of us. And dulcimers are really affordable to make. Um, they're like a super, they're like the poor man's instrument. And, and that's why they were created in the first place. Uh, <laughs> so that's a, a, a neat thing that I got to tour. And then um, a, another a piece of content was this whole Greensburg, uh, town of Greensburg, Kansas. Um, I interviewed the mayor. Uh, I took a tour through a silo house. Um, the woman that runs the big well, which is the largest hand dug well, I think in North America, um, she took me on a tour of the town, uh, which involved the high school and the middle school, um, the town municipal buildings, um, uh, the big well, and there was a couple of other places that we went to. And then the mayor drove me out to some of their, um, their wind turbines, the, the wind farms. Um, so we got to look at that when they were really working hard and producing with the decent average wind that they normally get there. Um, and so all of that's going to be side a side story. Uh, I won't be able to include all of that information in the documentary, if you will, but it, it, it'll it'll be additional too. Yeah, you can always publish your extra clips, and, and you know the people interested will watch those. Um, one thing, if you're, if you're publishing your your potential route ahead of you too is as you grow in fans, people watching your trip, they might actually help research places ahead of you and say, hey, by the way, drop by my friend's house or, hey, did you hear about this project? Yeah. And so you might start getting other people filling in your schedule. I want to get back to that. Um, I need to go and adjust the route on the website. So I would say within the next day or two, it'll be adjusted probably by the end of tonight um, because I've decided to not go through Salt Lake City and I'm taking the south route through Utah. And uh, that being said, I do have, for anybody that's listening and anybody that you know that you might want to share this with, there's a button on the website that says, ask Wayne, ask Wayne to stop by. And so that's a place where people can go and fill out a, a little form and they can give me a suggestion of somewhere I need to go or they think I should go. Or if they have a homestead or a friend has a homestead um, that they want to offer a place to stay um, that might have an interesting story attached to it, that's great. If not a bed and food is nice as well so i'm, I'm always interested I'm kind, of, I'm kind of jealous now of your whole trip hmm. um I'm, I'm really interested in, in the little projects that maybe aren't famous or anything but people's small solutions that are innovative for them and so if you notice those i'll always be curious and watching for them in your videos yeah um i agree with you similar things to a video that i made a while back and uh, anybody that wants to go to my youtube channel it's uh, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash a world for change the number four, um, but I made a video of a friend who has a greenhouse who runs it, cools it uh, mainly through um, solar, solar geothermal um, updraft uh, cooling, as well as then heated with rocket mass heater, and he runs a pretty large aquaponic system on 35 watts. So that in and of itself oh. is, yeah, that is a- Sorry, did you just say he runs an aquaponic system on 35 watts? Yes, a pretty good sized one as well. Wow, that's hey, great. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so the kind of stuff I want to hear about. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So that, now that wasn't on the trip itself, but it's those little tidbits of information yeah. that really help people like you and I to then assimilate that and 
apply it to our own life if if it matches what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Stan. I guess you posted a link to my channel. Um, so did Lanny. She got, but she got a better URL. I gave her the whole the numbers and the hard <laughs> stuff so that you know, because I'm a digital. Yeah. Oh, Lanny. By the way, it's um, it's a world for change, not the TV. The TV is the business. Uh, a world for change TV, where we broadcast our shows. Um, the personal YouTube channel where I did the interview with the guy with 35 watt uh, aquaponics system is a world for change without the TV. See, he's so picky about everything too. You I know, right? Can't please you the guy. Subscribe to both. I would appreciate it. <laughs> it would value you and your life. Uh, are you going to cut my pay? Is that the deal here? Is that what's going to happen? Uh. <laughs> now, this is really interesting stuff and we're going to, we're, we're running out on, uh, on about an hour, um, like 54 minutes or something like actually an hour. Cause we started a little early, Wayne. I wanted to get, you know, I wanted to go ahead and get started on this because there are several things that I found out once I had a chance to do some research, just like after our um, uh, long thing the other night, uh, which happened again last night. I don't know if you stopped in. I left um, around one o'clock, but um, the, um, uh, let's see, Simba, um, is that uh, I kind of lost my train of thought because I'm old like that. Hello. Hi, Simba. How can, what can we do for you, Simba? Just my first time here. What oh, is? Have you got any questions for anybody here? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, well we're for... just we're just talking about being sustainable and living life uh, in a, in a much better way. Where are you from? Israel. Oh, you're from Israel. Okay. Um, I know over in Israel, and let me let me just say this because I know you guys implement solar technology a lot more effectively than we do over here in the states. Everybody has solar hot water tanks sitting on the roof. It seems like I, I know I'm 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 saying everybody, but it seems like over there uh, you kind of have been forced to live in an area that's a little more barren, not quite as green and lush as what we have here in the states. Yeah. So, I mean, what's your perspective of being sustainable? No, just expensive. No one. No one buys. I got gotcha. you. Okay. I hear you. It's expensive well, I, and no one buys. Is that right? Okay. So now is that because um, all of the solar technology is too expensive for people to, to get into? I think it's just the bureaucracy because of bureaucracy. And mm. no, everything's slow. No, people just don't trust this system, new systems too much. So. Well, at least that's universal. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, that's maybe a, in new generations. I don't know. In new generations. Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know how every generation is new to me now. I mean, you know, we got socks that are older than most everybody here. Yeah. Oh, so, Simba, since we're here in the conversation, um, in, in terms of your own life, Simba, how do you kind of look at your energy use and what have you attempted to make any adjustments? I'm trying to less, I'm or how do you make now, your energy decisions? Uh, I'm trying now to move to hybrid vehicles mm -hmm. and I'm planning to change my change my car, my old car, to and buy a Toyota hybrid. That is, okay. Toyota Yaris oh. hybrid, and this is much more, uh, much more efficient because we drive, we drive like uh, one, 120 kilometers a day, and I don't know how, how, how many kilometers in miles, but it's pretty like two hours, four hours for driving per day. So I don't know. Do you guys over there in Israel, do you have any, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, federal money or state money that comes to you or rebates, if you will, in any way for making choices to buy a sustainable vehicle? Yes. Sometimes. Okay. Is it good? Is it worth it? Mm, not so many people use this. And I don't, I don't know. I don't really, I don't really hear about this. Hmm. That's it's interesting. 
you know, in my age, in my age, people just just looking for more efficient cars and not not for like systems for houses and by not buying new houses, just you know. So maybe I'm uh, 25 years old. So. Right. Ask. Thank you. And what brought you into this blab, by the way? What, what what was it that made you want to come take a look at this blab? I, I don't know. Just just, <laughs> just this is my first first um, first uh, live broadcast. Blab? So yeah. Well, we have we have a ten o'clock thing at uh, every ten every morning at ten a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a thing at learnblab.thecircadians.com. dot com, and in twenty five minutes we have we kind of teach you how to use it. There's a link. I'm going to put you a link here to to a uh, a document that we wrote that will help you learn how to use it too. And it's been do- and that, this document has been downloaded more than three times in the last four days. <laughs> wow! I think one of those was me. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. I'm gonna have to go pretty soon, but I just wanted to thank you for introducing uh, Wayne and I. I. I think what he's doing is inspiring. I love to hear about uh, people who have a chance to go look at projects, and I'll be watching your videos and stuff. Thank you. It was really great to meet you as well, uh, both of you. And uh, I put a link to my Facebook channel or my Facebook page as well. So come and add me as a friend and. I will follow you, your village page. Um, I'll follow that as well. Maybe we can build a relationship outside of this flat. Well, well th- and uh, work on your Spanish because maybe in a couple of years you'll be doing a trip down here. Maybe the trip down there is what's going to help me with it. <laughs> there is there is somebody in the audience though that I that it just occurred to me because this is the kind of this is the kind of stuff I like to do is that Chef Dennis is in the in the uh, audience. Chef has a show, a cooking show. And I just thought it would be interesting to see how you guys cook on a bicycle and how you're cooking down at the Boss Village, which might give all of y'all some, you know, a uh, little uh, airtime and get people to know kind of what y'all are doing and things like that. So, uh, yeah, and Chef just said that it would be fun. So, Alexander, would you mind if I asked Chef to step in here for a second and talk to these guys? No problem. Okay, man, you take care. Thanks for joining now, Chef is probably going to test Chef Courtney has been uh, breaking bread all day, so that's, okay. that'd be really fun to conversation and talk about food. Because yeah. one thing is also, it, it gives me like, what can I do in my life to be more sustainable and stuff? And the truth is, the most powerful thing people can change is how they eat. You know, that's that that affects all the world around them, and and it's it doesn't cost a lot to change, and and it and it uh, it's really the first step, I think. I think so. That's you, Chef. Hi. How you doing? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, and I've been on board with that for a long time. Starting with, uh, I think the first thing I really learned about sustainability was through Monterey Bay aquariums and sustainable seafood, because of all the issues we're having with seafood. And then I joined a group last year called uh, Mama Vation uh, and Chef Con. It's a group of eco-friendly. Uh, sustainable bloggers eating organics, non-GMOs and stuff. So I, I was actually there last year to talk about Google Plus, and I'm sitting in the back of the audience tweeting, doing my due diligence, and I went, what? They put what in our food? And then I started listening and started paying attention. So I drank the the, the Kool-Aid, and I've been you know organics. I've been sourcing. I actually just have some bison that I've been cooking that was the first yeah. that first type of meat. Like I haven't had a steak in 20 years. I stopped eating beef. So this guy from Texas asked if he could send me some bison and some wild boar. And I went, okay, that sounds good to me. So uh, I had my first bison the other day. It was good. <laughs> Fantastic. And, that, and that's, the, that's the type of cattle that we're here. That's mm-hmm. what's supposed to live in this continent. Yeah. So what? So how do we do a cooking show? <laughs> uh, I've been cooking now for longer than I care. What do you got? Bread? <laughs> yeah, that's her bread. Is that your I bread? Yes, <laughs> This is my favorite loaf that I that I made today, which is why it's mostly eaten. <laughs> oh, I can see that nice hard with a, mm-hmm, with a wood fired oven, and it's a really basic recipe, but it's tasty because it's got salt in it. I, I've never been much of a baker. I, I try. I do it for fun, and the only bread mm-hmm. I have made has been the artisanal loaves. You know, the no need kind of stuff. Uh, something that doesn't require oh, a lot of work. This is a this is a double need actually. It was it's really tasty. Oh, you know what I'm envisioning now is a, is a blab where 
where we've got Wayne out in somebody's backyard <laughs> cooking on his camp stove, where we're here cooking bread or something or doing some kimchi or something. And then you're, I guess you have a kitchen, right? I Jeff? do. I, I do, thankfully. Uh, I, I want to remodel it, but I do have a kitchen. I, I have an electric flat top range, and most people go, ooh. And I go, you know, I can cook on rocks. Oh, it doesn't yeah, matter. <laughs> No, I, I wish I had gas, uh, but where I live in Florida, I guess because of the hurricanes, we don't have gas. We have propane, and I'm not cooking on propane. Not you know, not unless I'm outside. <laughs> I did that one time at a restaurant. It was not fun. Uh, but yeah, if you know how to cook, you can cook on any environment. It's not a big deal. Yeah, we do solar here in wood. That's our preferred <sighs> method. So I've got a, a small solar oven, and I'm building one that's about three meters across. That's currently nicknamed the death ray, um, but it isn't nice. finished yet. And I'm going to put that together and I don't know what will happen. I might be able to like fuse glass or wow. cook pottery in it. I have no idea. Well, you could probably make a damn good pizza in it then. It's going to get that. <laughs> yeah, that too. With a hole. So be, you know, it, I really like this idea because visually that would be really exciting to like have a cooking. I do a show on Wednesdays and I've just started bringing in more people to do some different shows. I'm contacting some friends that. And that's a blab show? I, I yeah. I, if you go to my site, I got twelve of them scheduled right now. I'm a little okay. bit of an overachiever. <laughs> yeah, not all cooking. Uh, he's probably have, got. Uh, he's probably got three hundred, five hundred. How many shows have you got done, man? Only thirteen. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. I know, I'm talking about the shows that you've done. Oh, in oh on, on Google. Oh yeah, I have over three hundred of those uh, <laughs> on YouTube, um, but on Blab. But I'm trying to bring my friends over because I love this format, just how we're talking. So I'd love to do something with you where you're cooking and I can feature you doing that and introduce you to my friends. Because like I said, these my Echo friends would probably be like standing on their chairs cheering in this, you know, because when I told them I eat bison, they were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. They were so happy for me. Like I've just discovered gold or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love That's them. They're, they're so cool. I see Mia has showed up too. You know that. Yeah, Mia's here. That be that. That would be fun if we we just need five seats now. That's the whole thing about Blab. Right now, we need five I'm gonna, seats. I'm going to go ahead and step out. We have a sauna fired up, a wood fired sauna, and nice. uh, this is the day of the week we're going to try and get clean. Where are you located? Middle of Mexico. Mexico, Mexico. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm half Mexican, so I guess I could go old, there. Old Mexico. Old Mexico. <laughs> I'm gonna say I might take a drive over and see it, but I, that'd take a little bit longer. Yeah, it take a while. Yeah, it's an <laughs> It is possible to drive down here, though. I'm yeah. sure it is. And I'll post a link to the, the Facebook page again. And uh, we're gonna be making a video on bread here real soon. Okay. And that's one of Courtney's big goals is to come down and help me start broadcasting this, because just sitting around in the woods by myself is not gonna do it. No, <laughs> it's not that much fun either. You know. Well. Yeah. It has its moments. For including me in this and, and allowing me to do this with you. Mm. Um, Blab is really awesome. It's way, it's way better than that other Hangout thing uh, yeah. that I was using a while back. Yeah. Thanks again, so Stan. Adios. I'll uh, open my seat up for somebody else. No vaping. No vaping. No vaping. <laughs> hey, Mia, you want to come in? Just click the seat. Um, Wayne, so I, I figured that you guys would have – he's an interesting guy. I mean, we yeah. were in a oh, we were yeah. in a, a Blab the other night, and, and – you know, I could tell that, like I said, he wasn't in, you know, he wasn't in the uh, environment that we're used to. And I, we started talking about where he was at and it was just pretty. I pretty think cool. by the end of this thing, I'll be able to make a five course meal with a saucepan and, a, <laughs> a pop, you know, a can of spam. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You, you do it in the right order. You can do it. It's just you got to think a little bit ahead of what you start, move that to a plate and throw something else in there and just keep working on one pan. Yeah. I'm the king of one pan meals. <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny. You know why? Because you know what my wife calls me? What? One pan stand. I was going to say that. I was, does she call you that for cooking though? That, yeah, that's funny, man. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, she does call me that because I try to use on, I do. I was trying one to pan stand. I just got that. I'm sorry. I had <laughs> one pan stand. Mia, are you in Pittsburgh? I am. You guys have. How the hell did you get to Pittsburgh? Very carefully. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but we. I have an amazing view. That is the, the baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. oh. And then over on the it's other the side, to help on a live shot for CNN today. I felt very cool. Cool. 
So yeah, just I think I should just start doing a like where in the world is Mia and have you guys yeah. guess. Where like Wait, where's Waldo? Know. Where's Waldo? Well, Wayne's the same thing. So hi Wayne, it's good to see you, honey. What's happening? You're not gonna believe where I'm at right now. Denver. Yeah. Mother. You're looking really good, Wayne. You got some rest. Yeah, definitely. Been chilling and, and enjoying it. Good. I don't know if uh, if my the the special guest will show up today or not on live on recording, but. Oh, you do look good though. Good. Just hanging out with a little beat uh, down last time I saw you. Yeah, he looks well rested, especially after it. The 1,400 foot thing that you climbed yesterday. The, does Mia know where that's at or no? I, even I haven't done that. I, I take my happy ass to the bar and watch people do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, girl! <laughs> that is awesome. Now, where's my little dog? Oh, well, hold on. Where's me? She's what I need to you. know is where my dog is. <laughs> that little one stayed no, with me. And no, I, you're supposed to be here so you can babysit her in like two Hi, minutes. baby girl. I need to come back and see you. When are you coming oh. home so you can babysit her? Next week. Only for a week, though. You need to come to my event in Denver next week, girlfriend. Send me the message. I need a dog sitter the 17th, 18th, 19th. Are you home? Look uh, I'm home, but you know I'm voluntarily homeless. You do need to know this. So that's right. You can stay at my place if you want. There you see guys, this is how you get stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> Blab about it. <laughs> you do it. You go, hey Lainey, where you go? What are you doing? Oh, you want me to come stay? Oh, sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you house that's, and dog stay to have at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know where your place is. That's how we do stuff. That's so cool, Wayne. Look at you. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess I'm the special guest that's supposed to uh, pop in on the camera. <laughs> like this. I like, Hi. <laughs> that's awesome. That's oh, like, cool. we'll have to call it like Lainey on a stick, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> There's Mia on a go and Lainey on a stick. <laughs> That's oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Funny. Well, Mia, since you're in Pittsburgh, yes. years ago when I lived in the Philadelphia area, there was a guy named John. Well, he's still there. He's not dead. John DeBella, but he was the king of radio in WMMR, and he's since moved to other stations. He had a run in with uh, that guy in New York. What's his name? Uh, the talk show radio guy. Uh, Howard Stern. Howard Stern, yeah. And uh, it was ugly. But anyway, wow. John DeBella, whenever he said the word Pittsburgh, and it's ingrained in my mind, he would say Pittsburgh, where the air is green and yellow. No, where the sky is green and yellow. The plants are as smart as the people. It's not the end of the universe, but you can see it from there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I can tell you. Hey, I, that's awesome. I have to tell you, though, you hear Pittsburgh and you're like, uh, AKA shithole. But they've uh, cleaned it up. It's beautiful. Oh it's my God. Gorgeous. This yeah. is gorgeous. It is amazing, you guys. I mean, this view the, that we have going on here. So, yeah, this is Three Rivers thing going on. It is completely revitalized. It's oh, off yeah. the chain. Pittsburgh is just the place to be. It really is a great city. I'm glad you got to see it. Have you gone to Primenti? Primetti's? Primenti's? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I went today. So, uh, you know, it was really good. You know, what's been fun about this is I've been building my trip advisor, um, you know, reviews. clout reviews because I go and, and, you know, leave reviews for everything and that kind of ups you. So it'll be, it's nice because I'm going to go do, uh, do a review for them too. That was my only problem it was very good. Would you like to hear? Would you like yes, me to say it like an old New Yorker? Yes. Let me tell you, there wasn't as much corned beef on the sandwich as I wanted. <laughs> that was the other thing like that. What? Did you do fries and slaw on it? <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. I did. I did. Uh, yeah, I was like, what is that? I'm like, this is like a this is like a carb uh, uh, feast. Bitch it's lab. It's, it's very good. Yes, I did. What a great town, though. Steve, uh, Stan, have you been to this town before? Bring your little yep. accent here. Yep. It's been probably eh, 20 years, but it was a long time ago when I was there. You tell it looks different. It's a good yeah. town, though. Yeah, but it, was, it wasn't bad back then. It was okay. Oh, it's always been fun. Mm -hmm. It's just you been a little. It was a little rough. Pit, you don't mess around Pittsburgh. I mean, it's steel stuff, right? You got wine there. Did you like my sign I posted for you? The only, the only meal without wine is or what is it? Breakfast. I it's said. breakfast. <laughs> I have a question for y'all. Yes. The, the two in the bottom here. What could you tell Wayne that he you would really like to see him do over in that area on his bike? Uh, in what area, honey? Going from he's going from Denver. Well, to, yeah, uh, Utah, 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 Utah,
Yeah, so, is there some place where he should stop or someplace? Where is he going to cook at? What I want to know is, like, what should he pick up while he's in town so he can cook while he's out there on the road that chef's going to say this is the nutritional value that's going to make you be able to go just like Wiley e. Coyote. Well, well, he was a slow one, wasn't he? I don't know where, but for what? I mean, you want to get some protein in there, and I don't have to tell you that. You know that. Yeah. Uh, protein and I, being on the road on the bike, I might watch my roughage a little bit. But hey. He's probably learned that. He probably learned that by the time he hit Mississippi. I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, definitely some protein and something easy to do. You know, something you can season season up pretty good and, yeah. and throw in a pan and sear or, or do it over fire. You know, I would put it on the stick and put it over the fire. I, I got no problem with that. You know, there's a lot of ways to get creative and cook. Yeah. So I don't know if you could do this, but this is one of the things that I love. So if you're if you're at so maybe even at, at Laney's and she has a crock pot, is cook up a lot of chicken and get this chicken breast that's cooked. And then I also after that I go and I shred it and I and I fry it up in a pan because you know why not? Yeah. Uh, and then it's and then it's almost like um like uh what do you call it like when when you have the the beef jerky kind of thing because it doesn't really go bad as much as the cook. So you can have this like instant. You know, do it with some good, some really good olive oil or some, some, um, you know, not not really saturated oils, and then you can kind of have that on the road. How you like that? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. You can even, uh, and I know this isn't healthy, but I can pretty much eat what I need to eat, what I want to eat. You can eat. I, this, oh, yeah. You could drive through McDonald's right now at this point. You wouldn't feel good, but you could pull that off just yeah. with, with. Oh, I've ate some McDonald's, but I'll tell you, it's like you can eat, I don't know, three or four sandwiches at McDonald's and feel hungry in an hour versus eat. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, five are. bananas and two peaches and a box of, I don't know, raspberries or something, and you're good for two or three hours. Yeah, you, you need complex carbohydrates that are good complex carbohydrates yeah. that's going to, you know, with your protein. The protein is really important when you're working out like that. Um, you know what's you know, it's great though. You guys think about this, Wayne, where you are, we, that is like such a, a Colorado is such an incredibly healthy place. All you need to go do is go down to REI because those bitches are crazy down there. Yeah. And they do this all. So like, that's kind of normal for them to live this sort of lifestyle. I have a good crowdsource down at REI because it, they, that's all they do is they go and they mountain bike and they do all this. It's yeah. an incredibly active state. So they actually more than any place I've ever lived, they'll be like, Oh yeah, buy this, this, and this. Yeah, I like your chicken idea though because I can add it to like dried uh, that that instant rice. So that there's yeah. instant rice bags that you can get at uh, the big box store. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you get those and you just add water to it, heat it up, and boil it for seven minutes or whatever. But you could add chicken with some broccoli from yeah. Yeah, they got those new pronto pastas too. I have not tried them, but they're like a, a little bit of pre cooked or I don't know what they do in them actually, but they cook really fast. So even yeah. something like that, if you want some pasta for a little uh, carb load. And I have to do this real quick. My friend Stephen Futerall is in the house. I have not seen it. And he said, the only thing I cook in the crock pot is dog food for our four dogs, vegan here. <laughs> He's so funny. You guys, I was wondering if he was going to come over here because I know he was out doing a lot over on. Google Hangouts a while ago. So nice to see you, Stephen. Yeah, it is. I would I would like to to show off my um, culinary uh, knowledge and uh, pronounce something for y'all. Quinoa. Yep. Thank you. Did Thank you see you. Jay wrote that? Yeah. No. Yeah. Jay said quinoa, and I remember I was on some hangout with somebody, and said they said that they they just had a big pot of uh, quinoa. I was like, I, don't I, I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> the first time I had to ask someone at Whole Foods, I I, I looked around, I pulled him over, and I said, "How do you say this?" Yeah, yeah. Right? And you're like Quanana? What? Yeah. Well, I was going to go, and I couldn't find it. Why? Anyway, how do you say this? <laughs> yeah, quinoa though would be good for him, right? Look at Laney spells it out phonetically. I like Absolutely. that. Quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> I like um, wheat berries too. Wheat berries are great, and that would probably hold up pretty good. Yeah. You know what's good is a really old uh, a grain called spelt. S P. Oh yeah, aramanth spelt. You got it. Yes. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah it is. I must say good yeah. shit, but I can't say that on blabs. Good Wait, stuff. Do <laughs> you know I made some bread out of that? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. spelt is good. Oh, you really, really good. When you made it, how'd you spelt it? <laughs> Did you smelt it when you spelt it? He who no. spelt it dealt it. <laughs> what about um, uh, Tef? You, it. you use Tef? Tef is good. I, you know, I haven't baked with Tef yet. I, I have all these flowers. I, I'm this guy who buys stuff, 
walks by it for six months before he uses it. Mm-hmm. Like I just got my spiralizer out and I've had it and then I'll, I'll wave to it. Hi, I, I didn't forget you. And I do the same thing with flowers. Like I have some Tef and I have, I'm trying to think of the other flower I have. That How I do bought. you spell that by the way, you guys? E-F-F. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some excellent new flowers out. I mean, they make a flowers out of just about anything. Is that is that because of the the gluten challenges that we're facing as a society? I mean, we've got yeah. more and more people who are going gluten free. Yeah, and you know, and, and it's not just like I went gluten free. I'm I'm off of it. I'm not completely gluten free. I do eat gluten free products though whenever I can. But if I'm out and I got something on a good piece of bread, I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just that the wheat. The state of wheat that we eat today is really crap. Totally they different than when we were no kids, right? right? Oh, no, they have adulterated it. They have, you know, it's got like, I think, 32 chromosomes now or 36 as opposed to 12. And, and there is a really good flour. It's called, I think it's icorn flour that still is made. It's the European way. And it's still right. the, the, the regular, the real wheat before it was adulterated. So people are finding that they're not as allergic or sensitive to that. If you've got celiac, that's a whole different animal. Like I only was sensitive to it. Right. But these other flowers are great if you have celiac and they're actually a lot more nutritious. They're better for you. It's just you have the challenges of making certain like bread is really the hardest thing because it does not have the gluten. And the gluten is what makes bread really bread, you know. So bread. Yeah, yeah, that's why I carry a tube of gluten around with me just in case <laughs> I get to uh, well Steve Penier before he, or John Penier before he died, God rest his soul, he said, I don't know what gluten is, but evidently it's delicious. <laughs> right. That's like uh, that's like Kramer when he was like, I'd like extra MSG, please, you know. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so would gluten gluten would have an effect on Wayne's uh I guess his physiology and the way he's riding and stuff too, right? I, you know, I really don't know if gluten would have, if you're not sensitive to it, you know, like if you're not sensitive to it, there's no reason not to eat it. It's not like it, you're going to be healthier by leaving it out of your diet because it does play a part in some of the foods that you eat. And, it, you know, it's not like it's better to not eat any gluten. If, you know, if you're sensitive, yes, it's better to cut down the amount of gluten you eat. And some of these other flours are going to be better for you. And that's yeah. the benefit of it. But you yeah. know, it's not like uh, gluten is this beast that you should avoid at all costs. It's just. I know, think it's about the sourcing, Chef. You don't you think? Yeah. You really yeah, I think it comes to, again to the, the type of flour you use. Like I actually found at uh, Costco was some Italian double O flour, import, organic imported flour. So I bought that and I'm using that now for some things. Nice. Hey, boys, I need to bounce out of here. I'm supposed to be writing a presentation for Denise Wakeman that I'm giving on live streaming tomorrow while I'm on live streaming. Oh. More cowbell, more cowbell. More cowbell. Woo-hoo. Oh, that's brilliant. I need one of those too. You know, yes, I like more cowbell. cowbell. That's awesome. That wakes people up. Where's the stick? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I did bring my easy button, uh, but I did not pack it for Pittsburgh, so I, I didn't I didn't have that too. So hey guys, hey, you uh, what Jay. What'd you say? I thought you gave that to Jay. The <laughs> I just let him play with it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys, Jay's going to be on with Joel Com tonight, by the way. You should stop in and uh, and check out that that zaniness for what sure. What time is that? Uh, I think at uh, 8, 8.45 tonight. Great, great. Yeah, I'm oh, on at God. 6 with some bloggers. I'm trying to drag my food blogging friends over. Mm-hmm. I saw that. Hey, can I crowdsource real quickly? What do you think are, is the best spot for, because everything changes so quickly with live streaming. I know Eileen Smith has some great stuff on that. Who do you think is the most plugged in right now for the changes in live streaming that I can go source it? So I don't have to look this. Oh. Anybody? I don't have an answer for you. Don't pay attention to that. Yeah. Don't do, Yeah. Don't look behind the curtain. All right, cool. I'm just going to go look it up. I, for right now, for me personally, I, it's Ooh. really just Periscope. And uh, and Blab have been serving me well. I just periscoped. I was up over the the Overlook in uh, Pittsburgh. I had the MiFi going. Hit that up. I was doing the the little crab crab chowing the other day. Same thing. When you're on location, it's great. But then for topical kind of things, I'm using Blab for it. And then you can yeah. sit like this, right? I'll tell you the only reason I I've said this to Stan. I told Laney today at lunch. The only reason I'm using Blab, it's not because it's all shiny and fun and pretty and easy to use, but it's because they send you an embed link after the Blab's over and you can take that and embed it right on your website. You don't have to download it, re-upload it. You've got full content ready to go. Send out an email. That's why I'm using it. 
That's the only that reason I'm using it. I don't care what platform it is, honestly. So true. So the only, just to, to play devil's advocate on that real quick, and Ermine just popped in, girlfriend, I owe you a phone call. I, I got I got stolen away to, to Pittsburgh. My, my only thing with that is I do suggest downloading anything because not, we don't own any of this stuff. Yeah, I, I know. I agree. Well, with they that. changed some of the terms. They changed some of the terms, though. You read the new terms, right? No. Uh, I don't know. Tell me what I'm supposed they, to. Well, read. just go to the just go to Blab's page and look at it. They said they changed the terms of service now, and they changed who owns the content. That that's happened since that big day. You're talking about what the, when everybody was talking about this like a week ago, right? It was really up in the terms of service said that Blab owned all the content, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. It's I, still I, a free service. It's not something that we've paid for. Therefore, they can jerk it at any time. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, but the but question it, was whether or not you could upload that to another location and get it pulled away from you. And that terms of service that, that, that they put up the other day, when I I went through them pretty brief, and it was like, no, it's okay if you put it somewhere else. Well, I mean, but the bottom line I'm saying, too, and I, I, I think Larry Fernillier posted something the other day, too, about something easy where you could download all your YouTube videos, too, because, Chef, as you know, you almost got – a little bit yeah, yeah. by that of losing all of your content. So yeah, I'm, just, I'm just encouraging number. everybody to like the only thing you own is what you've downloaded per se and what's on your website. That's it. Yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. this shit could go away any second. Sorry. Yeah. There's an answer. yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, but it matters when you're on the road and you do want to be cognizant about how much data you're using. So no, that's true too. You're absolutely right, sweetie. So I think it's just more of a, like a plan. So your plan is like, like you yeah. had to be too. That's like, Hey, while I'm on the road, could you sign in and download all my stuff? Like there's yeah. a little, there's a, yeah, I totally agree though, because you have good stuff, but you're also, I know you're also fortifying it with, with different, like you're not just going in one, one place to post all your yeah. stuff. You're doing a great job with that too, by Thank the way. You. How long are you in town? And then I got to go. Uh, another day or two. That's it. Sorry. I gotta Sorry. I gotta hey, but by the way, I think you and I are gonna be able to figure start, figure something out while I'm driving from Denver to LA with the Kia. Yep. In two weeks. So hey. we got Kia Kia's giving me a Sorrento to drive from Denver to LA. And then I'm gonna and then I got him to let me keep it for another week. I'm gonna drive back. I have a feeling somewhere along the way. All right, yeah, mm-hmm. it's gonna take me about a week to get out of Colorado. So it'll be about yeah, a week or maybe eight to nine days. Cool. Out of Colorado and then Utah will be another 10 to 14 days. So that should meet up in Southern uh, Utah. Okay. Uh, uh, Persona wires says she just did that. I know. Oh, hello. No, I think we just meet it like some kind of big ball of twine somewhere. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, me being the person that I am terms of service. Here it is. Yes. Uh, no, it's your Lab allows you and your participants to record your voices, images, and surroundings. Anything that you transmit, display, feature, or otherwise made available through the site or app, including all intellectual property rights defined below, and such content is referred to as user content. You retain all of your rights and all of the user content you transmit via our service, as long as those rights do not infringe any third-party <laughs> rights. Stephen so. says legal blah, legal blah, blah. Our, 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 yeah, legal blah 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 He's blah. He's a lawyer too. I think that's I was going to say, let's get him know. Up for us. Yeah. Yes, yes. Ear, nose, lopped off. That's the whole deal. That's what it was. <laughs> ear, <laughs> ear, nose, lopped off. All right, so you guys. Been, love you. I'll see you guys later. All right. Thanks see for having us. Thanks. See you. Thanks. Guys, hey, I got to run too. I have a show at six, so I have to go get ready for that. And yeah. make sure that you get on that cooking show. And I want to do. I want to see that. I want to oh, see. I want to work on that with Wayne. It's like fun. So uh, yeah. We'll, we'll keep in contact with him. Wayne, you got another guest wanting to talk to you named Fuzzy Wuzzy. Fuzzy yeah. Wuzzy Annapolis. And he says you have his hat. I do remember seeing that earlier. <laughs> Hi, Wayne. What's up? Hey, glad to see you found Mika. <laughs> I have a question for you. Now, I Help deal mostly out. with kids on my YouTube channel. So what kind of ideas for grade schoolers and small kids could we give them to get them started in sustainable living, even if their parents really aren't into it? Hmm. Yeah, well, I think one of the, the biggest things that I've found after talking to teachers and those in the, the communities, they say that if they teach kids to just not litter or not throw trash out the window, and what it means when that trash goes out the window, that when when a parent does it or a grandparent does it and the kid sees it and reminds them that, oh, you're not supposed to do that. The parent real quick 
changes their tune and will make a shift in their behavior that's lasting when you teach the kids to call them out. So um, that might not be very direct at what to do with kids, but it helps adults learn how to teach and talk to kids about it. Yeah, and I know that some schools are starting to have their own gardens where kids can go out and it's part of their school day is to grow their own veggies and learn how they they grow and all about them. They mix them in with science. So have you found any schools in your travels doing that? Uh, I don't know. I haven't. I've seen it along the road, but it's been during the time of day where there's not been anybody there to answer questions and it's been through the summer. So I'm going to be coming into that more and more as the school year starts. And I do have full intention to try to find one at least to do a full interview on to really understand what they're doing to implement a program that works. But if you teach a kid that milk doesn't come from the store, it comes from a cow and then it goes to the store before they get it. Those are the kinds of simple little things that they need to understand. And, um, uh, those gardens and, and community style gardens at the, um, at the schools do work. I know I've talked to others that, that have implemented it, but I haven't got in depth with it. So, well, if you come to Las Vegas, they're just hitting their growing season. We were out at a farm and he started his corn about a month ago. So with, okay. with it hot down here, of course, yeah. it's too hot in the summer for some things. So you might be able to find a school down here if you happen to stop by our happy, happy little city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's probably too far to the south, but it's something that I've considered. So I would like to suggest something primarily because a hand puppet has now asked better questions than I was able to ask. And, uh, you know, and the more, more, more meaningful questions. And since the other person in the screen is an attorney, I'm pretty sure the questions ain't going to get any better after that. I, I don't know uh, about that, but I want to just, I, I just want to know where the puppet is. I don't, are any of you politicians? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to show you what sustainability means for my uh, I'm not year old daughter. For so I set up a garden yeah. in the backyard. Okay. This is what Just it so that we have that looks straight. like. That, there's, <laughs> I, I kind of figured that but, but this was the first hangout I popped in. Oh, not hangout. <laughs> oh, true. This was the first lab I popped into, and I, I knew Wayne would be okay with it. <laughs> Yes, he is. Now, what were you telling? We're gonna we're going to let Steve, the attorney, speak because he's gonna sue me if I don't give him his time. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll pop out so someone else can pop in. Now, I actually want you to be in. I want to talk to you about being in. The, we're gonna do some more interviews with Wayne, and I like your questions and making it like a regular part of the thing, Wayne. If that would be okay with you, yeah. like maybe five, ten minutes or something like that. Yeah. With Granny Smith, Applehead. Uh, <laughs> Granny oh, Fran. I'm, 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 <laughs> Uh, he meant that <laughs> was he and, they, and they say I have stuffing in my head. <laughs> so, so Stan, we were talking about gardens and sustainability and teaching our youth, you know, to grow goods and so on. Wayne, uh, Stan and Fuzzy Wuzzy, I wanted to show you what lessons my 13 year old daughter took from the garden that I set up in the outside our backyard. Can you see it? <laughs> That's that's all that's left of it, which is weeds. There is absolutely nothing there. I couldn't get the young lady to dig in the dirt to save her life. <laughs> I was going to tell you, we got kudzu and stuff here, man. You know. Uh, yep. You know, yeah, it's not a, it's, it's like we, we got a lot of. Yep, it's a kudzu garden here, too. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, as a matter of fact, kudzu, there's a lot of valuable things that you can do with kudzu. I just don't know any of them. Yep. So much for sustainability in my backyard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're, well, it's, it, it is going to be a tough thing. It's going to be a tough thing because it, it's all, every, I mean, you think about it when we were kids, that was the thing that everybody said, sustainability. Well, they didn't say sustainability. They just talked about saving the earth and everything like that. And we didn't care at that age. I mean, we just didn't. So how do you get them to do that now? Well, you know, it's a good question. I, oh, go ahead, Wayne. What I, Even if it, what I was going to say is, is I noticed when you're walking in there, it looks like you have some vines growing vertically there, maybe around the posts holding up your porch above you or, or yeah, something like actually that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. All the place. Planted all that myself. Yeah, like that's, that's really beautiful. And um, maybe your daughter would be into 
uh, maybe not, maybe she's not into getting dirty, but she's into reaping the rewards of growing good, healthy produce, potentially, if she likes it and it's good. So maybe try vertical, uh, like a vertical hydroponics tower or something that doesn't involve getting dirty and sweaty and, and the, the mindset doesn't think I have to work to make it happen. But it's, a good it's idea. technical and she might enjoy that. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea. Like they do the vertical tomatoes and things of that nature. Yeah, and maybe try using uh, hydroponics or aquaponics is a little more advanced, but try hydroponics first. And then if she likes it, then you can incorporate fish into it and there's your protein. Um, I don't know, that's a thought. Well, you know, we do, Stan, we'll, we'll incorporate discussions, though, going back to Fuzzy Wuzzy's discussion about children and starting at a young age talking about these things. The other night we were talking about Chilean sea bass and how that's really a monkfish. By the way, I showed her a monkfish. She will never eat Ch Chilean <laughs> sea bass. That was just a rebranding of a really, really ugly fish, right? Uh but you know, part of it is just conversation. Um, so I don't think it's just the schools. You got to take it home too. You yeah. got to educate parents. Yeah, yeah, that that's right. Um, another thing too that I think we need to work towards is um, where I said I don't think earlier in the show I don't think we were running out of room to grow food. Uh, but there might be better and smarter ways to grow food rather than just growing them. Um, out in open fields and watering it and letting it grow and harvesting, etc. Why not doing like do vertical um, uh, gardens that might be 13 stories or more high? These big high rises that are empty in in Detroit could be used for in like uh, internal farms or in, indoor farms that are growing food 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we can repurpose some of the already existing structures that we have in our society, in our towns and, and cities to grow food differently. Another um, uh, thing that, that I noticed is coming through Kansas, you look out on the horizon and the plains where there's a lot of grain being grown and you see these massive um, uh, uh, silos, like not silos, grain elevators and the grain elevators uh, many times have either been purchased and, and been swallowed up by large corporations like Cargill and ADM. And these small four and five and six elevator packets are sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, um, just not being used, rotting away, falling apart. And it's just they're, they're solid concrete structures that could still be used for something. And my comment to the mayor of Greensburg was, what about taking those things and putting floors in them and making them like little vertical um, living spaces for people might get two or three floors and and they keep they, they just rent space um, you can do uh, vertical farming in, in those kinds of spaces where you line the out the inside of one of those silos with with lights and then you rotate produce and you have this massive vertical space to grow in but all you, you're not rebuilding you're not using new um, or, or tearing down um, existing resources you're, you're not mining etc to build new uh, uh, new structures you're using an existing structure and you're just modifying it slightly to fit a new purpose where it, as it would never be used if you didn't do that so and that's that's fascinating stuff wayne uh, you have you seen examples of that any cities no i'm just no i'm thinking trying to think of just ideas and ways that we can use existing structures without having to um without having to tear them down, crush it up, and use that rock in asphalt. You know, I mean, why would we do that when the structure's already taken energy to put in place where it is? You uh, see what I mean? What I want to know is, can you do anything with the garden in my backyard? Can you start <laughs> yeah, See, that's, that's always the question. Because I know that a lot of that stuff, those ideas pop into Wayne's head after several hours of riding with no water <laughs> in 100-degree heat. And then he hits a bottle of wine, a couple of sips, and boom, he sees things. <laughs> potential. Potential. Well, we, there's a potential right there. And you're like, that's a, that's like a rock, Wayne. <laughs> yes, but you can cook on it. Yeah, yeah, you can. You right. can. But nobody's going to drive to a restaurant where they're cooking on a rock. You know? Wayne, Stan, thanks for letting me take a seat. I've got to run. I've got, uh, speaking of food, sustainability, et cetera, I've got to go to the grocery store because I've got a list. So it was good seeing you. Thanks again. for letting me in. I'll see you guys around soon, I'm sure. Good talking, Stephen. He brought more cowbell. 
I thought is that thing too loud? No, that's about right. Okay, you just well, need good. a drumstick. You really? Do. Yeah, I've got a drumstick around yeah. here, but it's, it's off of a chicken. <laughs> but it's a drumstick. That's what we call them here, anyway. Um, anyway, Wayne, it was really fun hanging out with you, man. And there was, you know, there were a lot of things learned. I like these guys, uh, Brian uh, Fay. We'll, you know, we can talk yeah. about. Uh, uh, he's a really interesting guy. I felt like you guys would hit it off. Yeah. You know pretty good yeah let me ask you a question is your are your parents amish or what is that yeah, german baptist yeah they're, german uh, baptist they're they're if, to, to look at them you'd think they're amish but um they're they're german baptist they have electric and drive vehicles and all that well i could tell they weren't southern baptist yeah. because you know that's what i am but right um, yeah yeah but they, they they were there was an interesting that's the first time i knew that when i saw your parents i was like he comes from a different background than most of us come from. Yeah. You know? And it was good. It was very good. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's helped me to have an open mindset about things because I guess I grew up very, um, I don't know, the, the right term for that sheltered, maybe, you know, you just didn't see quite everything and, and didn't get um, uh, outside influences like others might have. And so mm -hmm. it put a lot of questions in my mind, you know, well, why is something done like this? Or why do people act like that? Or, why is our culture set up in this way? And as I continue to have more and more questions, then I, I was looking for the truth. And I mean, I even challenged uh, religious beliefs because of that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you only see one side of the story, uh, you would hope that the mind wants to 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 change. It wants to uh, when you see one side of the story, you would hope the mind wants to see the other side. And if if you don't see the other side, then surely you're going to at least question it. Um, so that you can make a valid assessment based on uh, for your life and your understanding of it based on what's really there, the whole picture. And so that's really where I started to, um, that's kind of how I got out of that religious preference. So where are we going to do this again? That's a great question. Um, I'm thinking uh, I have to, you and I are going to have to talk outside of being live, but I'm thinking that uh, after about, seven to eight days, I'm going to be in um, Durango, I think is the town on the southwest corner of Colorado. And that would be a good place for me to find Wi-Fi. Okay. So when do you want to hang out and talk about that? Because I'm presuming that's what you're talking about, doing yeah, a hangout. We do that. Facebook uh, video yeah, you and I'll have to do that privately. Let's, um, uh, let's talk tomorrow morning. Okay. Can. Like what time do you get up? I get up as early as well. Well, not as early as you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Don't go there with me because a lot of people do. Hey, man, just call me when you get up. I'm pretty sure your wife doesn't like three <laughs> fifteen. You know, I'm pretty sure. Uh, like. Yeah, I'd say we could talk uh, tomorrow morning around nine o'clock. That works. Uh, nine central, which would be eight your time. Well, nine, nine o'clock. I'm sorry. It, it, it can't be nine. It can't be ten. Nine o'clock. We have. I have a scheduled. The circadians get together on a. Um, on a uh, call every morning at nine o'clock. That's 25 minutes. And then we have 10 o'clock. We have the 10 o'clock blast. Are you talking about Eastern? Or Eastern. So if we talk eight your time, that's 10 my time. Or no, I'm sorry. No, no, that's six your time. Yeah. Eight my time is six your time. So let's talk 11 your time. 11 would put it at nine. I can't, I can't 11 my, no, 11 my time would be fine. Yep. So let's yeah. talk 11 your time tomorrow morning, and then we'll figure out a good time to do another one of these blabs and get okay. the community together. That sounds good. Thanks for stopping in, Jerry, and for and Kevin, and and uh, Mia, and Fuzzy Wuzzy uh, animals. That was uh, what's 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 Lanny saying? What about me? I was getting to you. I was getting to you. <laughs> And of course, the ever lovely, effervescent Lanny Sullivan. We all thank her for being here as well. But we'll see you guys. Thanks, Kristen. And um, who else is up here? Michael's up here. I'm up here. Joan. Wow, uh, Bat Talks is Joan. Yep. I'm amazed, man. I am in my own blab. Jackie that Daniels. is really something. Yep. Everybody, peace out.